Hey, it's Mike here, and today, how the planet would transform on a vegan diet. We're gonna zoom out and look at the entire Earth and its systems and see over the course of the next five, 10, 50, 100 years, what might happen? How is it gonna differ from business as usual? We're gonna be looking at land and sea and air in the form of greenhouse gases, as well as things like food scarcity and infectious disease risk, something we're all concerned about right now. Obviously, this could be two hours long if I went into depth and everything. So instead, we're just gonna skim over things and of course, look at the research to get our best guess as usual. And real quick, I just wanna thank the nearly 2 million people that have seen my How Your Body Transforms on a Vegan Diet video. I never thought I'd get a video with that many views. So this is more or less the environmental version of that. Here we go. First of all, logistically to make all of this happen overnight, you would either need an authoritarian regime to veganize everybody, or we're just gonna go ahead and say that everybody on earth out of their own will decides to go vegan. You know, why not just say another dimension where there's another earth where everybody decides to go vegan. I know all the vegans are like, where's the portal? Get me to that dimension now. I guess to the point where I mentioned I have a bachelor's of science in sustainability. You know, that's kind of what the video is about. Might as well mention it. Anyway, let's just start a timeline here. We're going to be looking at what's gonna happen roughly at the end of a year and 10 years and 30 years, which would be 2050, and then about 100 years down the line. All right, so within year one, it's worth highlighting the basic changes that would take place. They're obvious, but why not? First of all, we're no longer using animals, which means you're getting rid of animal products such as meat, which by the way, the United Nations Environmental Program referred to as the most urgent problem. Meat is the most urgent problem. And then of course you're getting rid of cow's milk and cow's milk products, as well as eggs and other non-vegan little products here and there. But without the creation of those products, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of factory farms closing, all of those wet markets closing, and just a need to feed way less animals, which means you know, you're know you no longer feeding approximately half of the planet's grain to livestock, worth mentioning. Now this is where it gets a little complicated and we're just gonna simplify it, and that is what happens to all of the animals that you are no longer using, and I have a whole video on how you would lower the animal population down to a reasonable level. And it has different scenarios that people could choose from. It's either letting people have their last meat meal, in which case the population dives really quickly, or you can take the remaining animals and put them in animal sanctuaries, which would be a huge ordeal. Either way, you're stopping breeding new animals. So the population is going down pretty quickly. Most of the animal population would be gone in about 10 years. But for the simplicity of the numbers here, we're just gonna say that the previous few years have already been transitioning, so we already have that fully vegan world going on. Now that makes all the numbers simple. In terms of emissions of greenhouse gases, as I've said before, FAO reports show that about 15 to 18% of the world's emissions comes from the livestock sector. And so that is huge right away. That's a massive improvement. You're gonna get rid of almost all of that because you're gonna need to grow some protein sources. And one thing that is astounding is the difference and emissions between these plant and animal-based protein sources. From this Our World in Data chart, you can see that actually legumes are super low and nuts can be in many cases carbon negative. But what's even more persuasive to me than the greenhouse gas savings is the land savings, which are incredible. Looking to the US from the USDA, we use nearly half of the lower 48 land for livestock, which is ridiculous. And globally, we're talking about 30%, nearly a third of our ice-free land. This is some of the most fertile land that we have being used for livestock. And there's so much potential on that land that would be freed up. But this is where I need to look at this with a level head. We could just say, oh, best case scenario, we use that land for what it should be used for. And in the past, I've calculated that if we took that US land and we just planted trees on it, that we could sequester 88% of the vegan US's emissions. But I'm not gonna assume that. I wanna keep a level head here and say best case scenario isn't happening. Instead, maybe they would just let the land be and then whatever natural sequestration happened a little bit more slowly would count. In addition, it's worth mentioning globally, and we'll get more into this, that a lot of deforestation is the result of livestock. Obviously not all of it, but that is gone. So there's a lot of just global warming climate change force that is from livestock that would be removed. And these effects go beyond land in terms of switching to a vegan diet. The main threat to whales is fishing and people accidentally killing whales. That is no longer a threat. And as this study mentions, sperm whales in the Southern Ocean sequester about 200,000 tons of carbon, which is 730,000 tons of CO2 per year. And that has to do with how they fertilize the ocean and, and things sink to the bottom and all that stuff. But 
I wanna to get to another major benefit and that is just the animal save. This isn't necessarily an environmental metric, but in terms of land farm animals, we're talking about 70 billion within this first year. I could go crazy estimating marine life saved, but the numbers are so variable there. I'll just leave that out. Just know it's a ton of marine animals. It's like at least 5 million Nemos. And throughout this video, I also want to address some of the concerns that people might have. And I could see people being like, eh, in a vegan world, there'd be so many problems. You wouldn't have any manure to fertilize everything. So actually the global food system would collapse. We're gonna talk about the negatives of using that manure in a bit, but first of all, there's so many ways we can still fertilize. Obviously you have chemical fertilizer, which isn't ideal, but it is technically vegan. And then you have human manure, human waste that can be safely reprocessed into fertilizer. And then you also just have crop rotation because that nitrogen comes from those nitrogen fixing plants. When it's in an animal, it was originally from a plant and rotating the nitrogen with the non-nitrogen plants, you enrich the soil. Anyway, now you know that those needs are met. Moving on to about year 10, we can see some interesting stuff happening. An interesting phenomenon would happen within that first 10 year between these two scenarios, your normal and your vegan, and that has to do with methane in the atmosphere because methane is in the atmosphere for about 10 years and it quote unquote burns really hot in terms of its global warming potential. You know, over a hundred years is 32 times as powerful as CO2 in terms of warming. Over 20 years, it's 86 times as powerful and it's even more powerful in just 10 years. But that methane wouldn't be in the atmosphere. So there would be a non-linear lowering of warming in the vegan scenario. That would be an advantage. Another huge one here is water, fresh water in particular, which is going to be a benefit every year throughout this timeline. But I think at about 10 years, we're going to start to see a major difference in water shortages. And that is because, as the study mentions, a vegan diet uses about one fifth of the water as a standard diet. And in general, livestock uses about one third of the planet's fresh water. So imagine freeing up nearly a third of the planet's fresh water. That's gonna give you some major advantages in terms of resilience. Another cool one at 10 years is fish because we have a lot of collapsed fish populations throughout the planet. And according to this study, it takes about an average of 10 years for fish populations to recover. You know, it's not gonna recover all of them in 10 years, but we'd see major improvements in about 10 years. And in a vegan world, all of the fish would return to the oceans. Thine vegan prophecy hath decreed. I'm just joking. You know, I'm not trying to make everything too much of a fairy tale here, but you know, that's what the science says. So that's gonna happen. Another astounding one is the shrinking of dead zones. We have about 400 dead zones throughout the earth, depending on the time of the year. That's places where there's too much fertilization happening in the ocean, eats up all the oxygen and then kills species. We have, of course, a massive one in the Gulf of Mexico in the US. But it's pretty clear that these would shrink massively if not disappear in most cases, not all cases, because there's just human populations that would continue to create some. But looking to this Mighty Earth report, animal agriculture is giving the lion's share of dead zone fuel to the Gulf of Mexico. In particular, Tyson is the single largest contributor that's a massive US meat company. And this is very personal to me because that very poopy state in the middle of the US in the map from that report is my home state of Iowa. Iowa, poop yeah. But that map particularly shows the amount of nitrogen in various watersheds, and it is just so much higher throughout Iowa, and that is because of these confined animal feeding operations having their manure broadcasted onto these fields, which are also fertilized, and the majority of those fields are going to feed that livestock. It's basically a big feedlot. You get the idea. It's also worth just overlaying this map of factory farms onto that Iowa nitrogen water map. Yep, uh, it's, it's a lot of poop. So of course we have no large scale animal manure entering the waterways and you think, oh, well, we still have all of that human poop. As I've mentioned in the past uh, from this government paper, there's about 130 times more solid animal waste than there is human waste. We're talking about, you know, five and a half times the population of earth in the US alone worth of animal waste. So yeah, it's not gonna be as big of a deal. And of course, this formula in the Gulf of Mexico isn't just in the US. We're talking about throughout the world and in particular, the largest man-made dead zone in the Baltic Sea is largely fueled by animal agriculture as well. You know, and to back that claim up, the authors of a pretty major 2018 paper on this Baltic Sea dead zone told The Guardian, in terms of the general public, one of the main things to do in the future may be to reduce the proportion of meat in the diet. And they particularly cite the nutrient inefficiencies of growing animals for meat. But this brings me to food scarcity. And it's pretty clear 
you know, we can't change the entire system of how resources are distributed, but there would just be a major advantage in preventing people from going hungry in this scenario. I mean, in the U.S., the grain that we feed to livestock alone would be calorically enough to feed every hungry, quote unquote, hungry person on Earth. Another point that may or may not be affected within 10 years because it's really a roll of the dice has to do with infectious diseases. The CDC has pointed to the avian flu H7N9 as, you know, a probable next likely contender for a large pandemic. And that has a pretty freaky case fatality rate of 30%. So we really don't want that to happen. That is way higher than COVID. And of course that virus is developing and remixing within the confines of animal operations. If animals aren't being confined, the lethality of a virus goes down because if it kills an animal that is far away from other animals, it can't spread. But if it kills an animal with a bunch of animals right next to it, it can spread quickly. So that is why natural strains of the flu don't kill birds. They don't kill anything. It's when we start confining animals and interacting with those animals that those diseases get fatal and then spread to humans. And of course, we're not going to have any more animal confinements. So that's a huge plus. Another one which will start seeing the benefits around 10 years would be the species extinction aspect. And as I've mentioned, this paper before claims that the leading cause of species extinction is likely human carnivory or the consumption of animals. And they cite a bunch of the reasons that I've talked about and will talk about in this video. And this somewhat newer paper not only agrees that meat is the main driver of species extinction, but it says that we're set to lose approximately 60% of our megafauna or large animals. Who knows exactly how many extinctions would be prevented over the first 10 years of a vegan planet Earth. But I know one thing for sure, I wanna keep this giant Chinese salamander around. I think you can agree. But of course, as China expands its meat production, it encroaches into wild lands and puts that animal more at risk. And at this point, at 10 years, we're talking about 700 billion land animals saved. So that's cool. Now we can move on to 30 years, which is the year 2050. 2050 is just one of those years that scientists like to predict things to happen or not happen by. And this Guardian article went through a bunch of environmental studies and sort of stitched together this picture of 2050, which doesn't sound super nice. Of course, we're talking about increased hurricanes and droughts and food shortages and those rising sea levels, all the stuff that we don't want and Amazon that may or may not be turning into the Sahara. And uh, we're gonna talk about some of those, but first let's just touch on the Amazon because there's a lot to be said there. Based off various reports, it's fair to say that about 80% of Amazon destruction stems directly from livestock. And, you know, you've heard about the Amazon being on fire. Well, that is also mainly driven by cattle ranchers. So with these meat pressures off the Amazon, it would be able to recover. And from this paper, in about 20 years, you see an 80% biodiversity recovery in the Amazon. So by this 30 year point, it would be looking significantly better. Now, in terms of emissions in 2050, one of the main global goals is to keep the CO2 level in the atmosphere at 450 parts per million at 2050. So we're not going past that. And that's supposed to prevent all sorts of climate catastrophes. And to accomplish this, they say we need a 55% drop in global emissions. Now, I don't want to say a vegan world would just automatically be organized enough and have the political will to nip this in the butt, but you have a major advantage because of that 50 55% drop that is required, you know, we have that 15 to 18% already automatically baked in. Because of that, you're talking about, you know, 35 to 40% drop in emissions that is required. And that doesn't count the sequestration that would just occur on the land that you freed up. So there's a one-two punch and another huge benefit just by a lowering in emissions means you're delaying some possible domino effects within the environment, such as the frozen methane in the ocean thawing and then creating rapid warming. So that's just something to think about. Environmentalism is fun and not depressing at all. And now to address another concern that a rational person I think would have when talking about the shift to a vegan world, and that is what would economically happen to all of the people that are in the livestock industry? Again, I can't speak to the best case scenario or political will of the earth at that point, but 
you very easily could just have programs to support those people or transition those people in the same way that Elmhurst used to be a dairy company and now is a plant-based milk company. And while this video isn't focusing too much on health, one thing to consider is the economic health benefit. That's exactly what this study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences did in 2016. And they say, quote, overall, we estimate the economic benefits of improving diets to be one to 31 trillion US dollars, which is equivalent to 0.4 to 13% of global GDP in 2050. And of course, they do say there would be food system shifts that would be necessary. So it would depend on the type of shift that occurred. People still need to eat and they're still gonna pay to have food products eaten so people can just shift which food products they're making. Anyway, moving on to fish. There's one line that you may have heard, pun intended, and that is that we could see fishless oceans by 2050. Now that was an eye-opening worst case scenario, but it's pretty clear that in the vegan scenario, uh, you're gonna see very fish full oceans in 2050. But seriously, 30 years down the line, we're talking about a complete recovery of marine species throughout the entire globe. I mean, there's nothing to stop it. All right, at 30 years, our animal safe starts getting pretty ridiculous. We're talking 2.1 trillion land animals saved. Farm animals alone, so that's pretty awesome. And the last point worth mentioning at 2050 is that we, we have some predictions for another pandemic probably happening by then. And just in terms of H7 and 9 again, it would probably just go extinct because we wouldn't have that confinement for so long. You know, there'd be no confined host left for it to maintain its lethality. All right, now to our last time point, and that is 100 years out. At this point, we're talking about going past 2100, where the estimates are about a seven degree Fahrenheit global temperature rise and about a two meter rise in sea levels. In terms of wild animals at this point, we're looking at that 60% of megafauna that probably would have gone extinct, you know, largely not going extinct. So that super chubby salamander would still be around. Sadly, uh, those Japanese hornets probably would also still be around. It's very not vegan of me, but I kind of think it would be cool if they became extinct anyway. Now, in terms of food scarcity and hunger, right now we have about 9 million deaths per year from hunger, and it's projected to go up, but assuming that it would stay the same, we're talking about 900 million hunger-related deaths in the next 100 years in the current scenario. But in the vegan scenario, I don't wanna say they would all be gone, but the chances of getting them way lower would be way higher just due to the amount of land that we've talked about freeing up. And in terms of the effects of climate change, the effort that would be required to bridge the gap to sequester that carbon because of our lower emissions, because of all of the land, it would, it would just be way more likely that we would prevent catastrophic climate change. Because again, we have to contrast the other trajectory, the current trajectory, which is developing nations increasing their meat consumption and increasing their emissions due to that. So that's... <laughs> So the case is pretty strong, and that brings me to our final figure, the amount of animals that would be saved. And it's hard to get emotional over numbers, but this is a pretty emotional amount. That is seven trillion land animal lives saved. Nothing to scoff at. Okay, there's so much that I decided to leave out just to keep this video watchable, things like pollution in general and in waterways, and the list goes on and on and on. But one more point I wanna mention is that a lot of blame is rightfully being put on corporations in terms of climate change instead of people and individuals in climate change. And to that, I just wanna say that we pay our money to the corporations. We are the ones that support them. It's not just meat corporations, but some of these massive meat corporations have a pretty good share of those emissions and they would just not exist in this scenario. So personal changes like your diet really do count and that sentiment is echoed by the author of this 2018 paper in Science that looked at the impacts of diets. They told The Guardian, quote, a vegan diet is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on planet Earth, not just greenhouse gases, but global acidification, eutrophication, which is that fertilizer causing dead zones, land use and water use. So yeah, helping the planet by going vegan isn't just a crazy vegan idea. It's it's common sense at this point. And I could reiterate all of the things that I've talked about. But most of all, this vegan scenario just has more tools to use low tech 
things like planting trees to prevent climate catastrophe. And that is probably the biggest advantage. And of course I can make videos on videos on the health benefits we would see in this world. And you've already seen the seven trillion animal number in terms of lives saved. So this is pretty, pretty compelling to me at least. But let me know what benefits that I forgot down below because I definitely left out a ton. Anyway, if you like this video, feel free to give it a like, share it. If you subscribe, hit that notification bell and now you have to go into notification settings to really even find out about all my videos. So go ahead and do that if you want. And thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.